Welcome everybody. We have four more minutes before we get started. If you would like to uh, type in the chat box where you're located, that would be very useful, please. Maryland, Northeast Ohio. Welcome, Kathy. Where are you located at? Flat Rock, North Carolina. Wow. Oh. Colorado. Oh, we're coming from everywhere. Wisconsin. Quite a diverse group. Welcome everyone. We still have two minutes left to go uh, before we start. If you want to type in the chat box where you're located, that would be beneficial to me at least. Uh, we got Wisconsin, Colorado, North Carolina, Maryland, Ohio. So quite, quite a group of us. I'm here in Kentucky. Ah, neighbor, Missouri. Hope everybody had a good Halloween. Welcome everybody, one more minute to go and then we'll get started. Oh, Angeline's from Ken Kenya. Whereabouts in Kenya? I've been to Kenya, lived there for two years. I went to the University of Nairobi in Kenya. We got about 30 seconds left to go. If anybody would like to please type in the chat box where you're located, then we'll get started. One more minute. Oh, you live in Nairobi. I'm sure it has changed a lot since I was there that was many years ago. Almost 40. Okay, I have three o'clock, so we are going to get started. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Jackie Jacob. I am the coordinator for uh, the Small and Backyard Flocks Community of Practice with eExtension. eExtension is the electronic version of the National Cooperative Extension Service here in United States. Uh, run by the land grant universities of which University of Kentucky is one. And as part of my uh, responsibilities with my job and as the coordinator for the small and backyard flocks community of practice, I organize the monthly webinars. Um, today's webinar I'm also presenting and I am also presenting uh, next month when we will be discussing an overview of um, chicken anatomy or poultry anatomy, I guess. Um, so this is being recorded. Uh, recording will be made available later uh, for anyone who would like to see it again. Uh, it will also be shared on our uh, Facebook page. 
And so um, I have to warn you up front, I uh, just got back from Bangladesh and um, on the plane flight of 16 hours, I picked up COVID. So um, I'm in quarantine at the moment and uh, dealing with the effects of COVID for a, for a week now. And I am uh, may lose my voice, but I hope not. So we'll see how it goes. I will be drinking a lot because of my problem. Okay, let's see if everybody, can everybody see my PowerPoint? Mixing your own feed. If you could type in the chat box that um, you could can see it. Um, okay, I'm getting, yes, 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 okay. Perfect. Um, if at any time you have a question, you can either type it in the chat box or the Q&A. I do believe the system does alert me that there is a question. If the question is related to what I'm talking about and is simply a clarification, um, I will stop and answer the question. If it is uh, something off topic and you're more than welcome to, you know, if you think of a question, put it in, um, I will deal with them at the end. So, um, as I said, today's topic is on mixing your own feed, in this case, poultry feed. Um, I don't deal with ruminants uh, at all. Okay, come on. Okay, so the first question that you should ask yourself if you're thinking of making your own feed is why? Why would you want to make uh, a balanced diet for your birds if you can buy it commercially? There are a lot of different types of feeds out there, um, at least here in the United States, Nigeria and uh, Kenya that can be, depend on where you're located, I'm sure. Um, if you wanted some organic and you couldn't get organic in your area, that could be a reason. Um, but it is complicated to make a complete feed. You have to meet all the nutritional requirements, just like you would have to do for your own human nutrition. For poultry nutrition, you need to meet all the nutritional requirements. But there are times when it may make sense to not buy a commercial feed and uh, think about um, putting together your own diet. And so the, another question you need to ask is, uh, who are you making it for? Um, feeds are, can be different depending on the, the species being raised, the strain or variety of the, the species, whether it's a duck egg or a meat egg, a chicken egg, or a, um, I mean, a, yeah, chicken egg or chicken meat or goose or, you know, goose for feathers or goose for meat or goose for foie gras or a turkey. We don't normally do turkey uh, eggs. We usually do just do turkey meat. Um, but why are you, who are you trying to feed it for? The diets will be somewhat different because the nutritional requirements will be different. And so the other question, of course, is what is your ultimate goal? You're taking all these feed or feed ingredients. You're going to feed it to your flock of whatever types of birds. And you are either going to, you know, beat meat or eggs, or maybe it's going to be feathers or liver for foie gras, or it's going to be, you know, show birds or uh, something like that, that, um, you know, you want the prize show bird. Uh, whatever your uh, goal is will affect somewhat the nutritional requirements. Basically, the, the components of the feed are very similar. They're just mixed uh, differently. Oops. And so you have some options and you have to balance the, the benefits versus the cost. So 
uh, here I have eggs, but it could be feathers or meat or whatever your goal is. And then you have to think about the cost and the labor involved because some of the uh, alternatives would cost more money I and mean, cost more labor because you would have to locate the ingredients, mix the ingredients, bag the, the feed and all that kind of stuff. So you have to balance the cost and benefits. And of course, the easiest option, which is what we started with, was the complete feed. Um, for the average person, that may be the way to go. If you think that you can mix a similar feed cheaper, you can't. Um, they're buying in bulk. They're using large equipment. Um, you know, the, the uh, economics of the, the returns is uh, better for them. Um, it, you know, it reduces the cost of production and they are specifically formulated for the time, age and production level of the birds. Um, but they're, you know, easiest is not always best. So uh, that depends on, you know, other situations. So I get a lot of people who say, okay, I free range my chickens, so I don't need to feed as much feed. Now that can be questionable. Uh, if you want to get excellent production, uh, meet up to their production potential, you still have to provide them with complete feed. Um, you know, when you think about it, what can the chickens get while they're on range? Um, they may get some insects, but this the type and quantity will depend on the season and time of year and on the particular uh, pasture crop and how it's managed. We did a study a couple of years ago where we went out into an alfalfa field where we were raising some free range chickens and collected insects um, at different times of the day, uh, different times of the year, um, with or without chickens present, and uh, analyzed all the different types of insects that we were able to get. Of course, it was just a sample. And we found that depending on the crop, because we did go to another field that was not alfalfa, there were different grass fields, we got different, different uh, insects depending on the location in Kentucky, the crop that we were growing, um, and the time of year. And of course, the chickens can also eat up things pretty fast. Um, my nephew lives in northern Canada, and they have an insect problem, almost like locust, you know, infiltration. And um, the chickens in their fenced in area will clean up every single one, but right outside that fence where they can't reach, there are plenty more. So um, the chickens that, you know, may or may not have access if you've got them confined or if they are free ranging, they may finish off a larger area. And some people like to think that the chickens get uh, something from their foliage. They don't really get a lot from their foliage. Um, I like to say chickens are not cows. They cannot digest cellulose. So the nutrients that they can get from a pasture crop depend on the choice of crop and how it's managed. Uh, typically, you see here the, the um, pasture is very long. It, it's best to chop it off a little shorter so that they're getting fresh growth and not old growth. Um, the fresh growth is a little easier to digest than the, the larger growth, but they still don't get a lot from it. And so the chickens that are, are on free range, they still need the same nutrients to grow and produce eggs as ones in confinement. And you're not getting a lot from the, from the free ranging. So uh, they still need energy, they still need protein, they still need the major minerals and vitamins in order to reach their genetic potential. If you don't mind having them laying next to nothing, then you, know, you don't really have to feed uh, a complete feed um, or you can feed a substandard one and get uh, lower production. It might be cheaper, but um, you know, it might work out in the cost benefit 
balance. So if you look at a feed, just to get an idea of what's in a feed, this is a layer pellet feed that I got the, the tag for made in Tennessee. And it tells you, you know, what's the guaranteed analysis for it. It's very um, generic type of thing. Um, but if you look at the list of ingredients, which will give you uh, an idea of the kinds of things that you need to put together to feed your, your chickens or ducks or whatever, um, you'll first, it's always the ingredients are listed by uh, the one used the most. And so energy is the main uh, nutrient provided in feeds and they are provided by processed grain byproducts and grain byproducts. So the grains basically provide the majority of the energy that's going to go into uh, the diet of the, of the birds. And um, most of those grains contain carbohydrates. And so what are carbohydrates? They're basically just compounds of carbon, which is the C's you see there, the hydrogen, which is the H's and the oxygen. And there are different forms of it. And then there are uh, non-starch compounds in addition to uh, of those. So if you just uh, remember some of your biology, um, a carbohydrate is basically a bunch of sugar strung together um, to make a polysaccharide. And then starch is the form of the carbohydrate in plants. Glycogen is the storage in animals, including humans. And cellulose is the form that you find in plants. And we're feeding plants to the, the birds when they're on range or they're eating um, yeah, I guess plant more cell wall, so because starch is in plants. So the starch molecule looks very similar to the cellulose molecule in that it has glucose strung together, but the big difference is how the uh, molecules are attached. So in starch, it is an alpha, 1,4 uh, alpha glycoside bond, and in cellulose, it's a 1,4 beta glycosyl bond. So it's just the orientation of the bond between the glucose molecules. And this has a big effect on how the molecule is digested in the digestive tract of, of birds. Um, ruminants have microbes that can digest cellulose because they can break that 1,4 beta glucoside bond, but animals do not. So it, the substrate, which in this particular image is a sucrose molecule, which is just two simple sugars stuck together. It has to fit into the structure of the enzyme molecule in order to break the, the um, the two particles apart. And I, st I stand corrected, it's not two glucose, it's a glucose and a fructose. If that does not fit properly because the bonds are different, it can't, the digestive enzymes can't work. So the enzymes in the stomach of, um, or in the digestive tract of poultry can break the alpha 1,4, uh, glucoside bonds, but not the beta. So they can't digest cellulose, but they can digest starch. In most commercial poultry diets here in the United States, corn is the main uh, cereal that we use to uh, produce for um, chicken, for poultry feed. Um, other parts of the, of the world use different things, but United States is primarily a corn-based uh, uh, feed. But as I said, there are other options. Barley is one. Um, Canada and Europe use uh, a considerable amount of barley. It's a moderate amount of energy. Um, there are different varieties of barley um, and some varieties have anti-nutritional factors. Um, the levels will vary depending on the variety and they can result in paste events 
These can be treated with adding feed enzymes to the feed to help to digest those anti-nutritional factors and make barley a suitable grain for use in uh, poultry feeds. Wheat is another one that is uh, a major energy source in many countries, including Canada and Europe. It's high energy. Um, it pellets well, so if you're making pellets, uh, which many commercial flocks do, uh, but it has no pigment. So if you compare it to the yellow corn that we feed, it has the yellow pigment, which gives us the yellow yolks and the yellow skinned chickens. The wheat um, doesn't have that, neither does the barley. So often they feed uh, some um, pigments like marigold leaves or petals to give that color back. And again, there are different varieties with different levels of gluten protein and they can result in pasty beaks and vents. And again, feed enzymes can be used. Um, it also grinds very fine, which can also cause pasty vents and wet litter. So uh, it has its benefits, especially if it's a low cost, um, but it also has its issues that have to be dealt with. Oats is uh, low energy because it's high in fiber. Um, some just regard as a filler. So in a lot of uh, layer diets, they'll often use it as a diluent to um, change the density of the diet. Uh, it can be used in limited amounts, but naked oats, which basically the hull falls off when they are harvested, has less fiber and therefore can be used uh, with less problems uh, with that regard. But um, because of the fatty acid profile of naked oats, you can change the nature of the body fat in chickens and make it more oily. Um, and so you'll often have to limit naked oats simply to not change the texture of the meat um, if you're raising uh, chicken meat. Sorghum is another one. It's often used in Africa. Um, and it also is used in Southeast uh, United States. It contains tannins, which is an anti-nutritional factor, interferes with digestion. The darker the color, the higher the level of tannins. Uh, there are varieties of tannins though that do not, I mean, uh, varieties of sorghum that do not have tannins. So they can be used almost identical to corn. Um, Again, it doesn't have the pigment for the yellow uh, yolks and yellow skin, but it can be used. Millet is another one that's used in Africa and Southeast Asia. Again, different kinds of millet. There's been a lot of research. Um, they did a lot of research here in Kentucky on pearl millet. There are different kinds of millets um, and it, they can successfully replace corn in poultry diets. Now that does not mean a one-to-one -one on a weight basis substitution. It means instead of formulating the diet with corn, you formulate it based on the nutritional profile of the pearl millet. So this is the, the pearl millet. And pretty much any grain can be used. They all have their limitations. Um, Corn is used as the gold standard that everything is compared to. Quinoa is a uh, South American um, grain. It has uh, some anti-nutritional factors that have to be dealt with before it can be used. Um, rye has uh, some problems of its own. Uh, buckwheat has been used a lot in, in Minnesota. The Buckwheat Growers Association has their own feed mill and a lot of their diets are buckwheat based. So one of the things that you can do if you grow your own grains is that you can purchase a protein balancer. It basically has the protein and the vitamins and minerals that would go with the uh, grain that you are growing, and then you mix them together according to the specifications uh, on the package to get your complete feed. Um, the main company that I know of that does um, the nutri nutrient balancers is Fertrell. Fertrell. He does a lot of work with um,
uh, he does a lot of work with uh, organics and with um, the, um, the the nutrient balancers, pasture poultry. So um, it's the only one I know of. That doesn't mean that there aren't others and I'm not promoting his over anyone else. Uh, I just happen to know of them. Um, and basically it has what you need to go with your own grains. So just follow what the grains say and uh, mix according to the instructions uh, on the label. But if you are using your own grains, you need to be really careful to make sure that the grains do not get moldy in storage. And even if you remove the mold, the mycotoxins that the mold produce remain. So you can make your birds very sick. You can even kill them if you fit, feed any grain that has been contaminated by mold. So um, most of the feed mills will test uh, their deliveries of grain for the um, mold and mycotoxins before they add them to the, the feed um, and they'll reject any delivery that has really moldy grain. So um, that's another benefit of getting the complete feed. But if you're using your own grains, then make sure that you are careful on the molds. And some of the symptoms of mycotoxins are reduced feed intake, reduced body weight, reduced immune response, decreased egg production and shell quality. You get increased mortality, increased leg problems. There are many different kinds of mycotoxins. So it depends on the level uh, and the type of mycotoxins that the birds are consuming uh, with regards to um, how they uh, react to it. So if you look on the feed label, you will see bentonite listed here. Bentonite is added to livestock feed as a toxin binder. It's a, a way of, you know, a safety measures in case there any molds or mycotoxins get through that there is something in the feed that can help bind it up. Of course, if it gets overwhelmed by mycotoxins, it makes it very difficult for it to prevent any problems, but um, at least the, there's something there that you can do to prevent the mycotoxins. The other thing that you can do if you are feeding grains um, is to feed whole grains. And um, there's a lot of different kinds of research out there. Um, most of the research comes from Europe um, and they've looked at whole wheat because wheat is more popular in uh, Europe than it is um, in the United States. And most have looked at broilers because the, the research is easier to do uh, quickly with broilers. Um, there is some research with layers, but not a lot. Um, and there is some research with sorghum, barley, and pearl millet, but some of the other ones uh, might not um, have as much research behind them, but there, you can feed a whole grain and, and have the uh, balancer separate um, and let them choose. So, the research results have been contradictory. So, you know, one price get a benefit for one thing and not another or vice versa. Um, there have been some benefits on the gut microflora. There's improvement in the gizzard function because it has to grind up the, the grain instead of um, getting it already ground. Um, there have been mixed effects on performance and mixed effects on feed efficiency. And a lot of that has to do with the type of bird, the age, the diet itself, um, as well as um, whether it's, you know, fed separately as choice feeding or whether it's mixed in and pelleted. I mean, th there's a lot of different research um, so if you, something you wanted to try, you, it would save you on grinding costs. Uh, make sure that you provide grit for the chickens so that they can grind it up, makes the gizzard 
function with the grit. A grit is just small stones or, or pebbles that get into the gizzard to help it di uh, grind up the whole grains. I said the other thing you can do is choice feeding, which was really popular in the 1930s. It's starting to come back a little bit. Um, and it, it's based on the ability of birds to select a balanced diet when given a choice of ingredients. Um, it requires extra equipment because you have more than you need more than one feeder. Um, the feed form and shape can affect it. Birds prefer to eat larger particles as they grow older, so they may select based on particle size and then, of course, the feeder design on how to do it. But um, out of North Carolina, Appalachian uh, College or University or whatever it is, they um, do a lot of work on choice feeding. They look at uh, uh, black soldier fly larva and other feed ingredients, potatoes, they use a lot of different things that they can give the, the birds to choose from and have them um, create their own diets. Again, the results can be variable because it's kind of hard to have a similar study over and over again because it depends on what ingredients you have, how they're given to the birds and all that kind of thing. So, but it is an option and it can uh, save you on the mixing costs if you uh, let them select for themselves. Sprouting grains has been um, something that uh, some people uh, suggest. Um, there's a guy who is into sustainable poultry production. He's trying to make his uh, farm self-sustaining and trying to come up with ways to um, produce um, food on the on his farm instead of um, bringing it on and one of the things that he uh, highly recommends is sprouting grains um, not that big on it but um, if it's something you want to do uh, it can be done it works best with smaller flocks larger flocks you tend to have to watch out for the molds uh, and other things going wrong but if you compare sprouted grains with non-sprouted, and I don't off the top of my head remember what kind of grain this was, um, it obviously was not uh, high in protein. So, it, you know, it's a cereal grain of some sort, mostly starch, has some calcium and phosphorus. Um, whether or not that phosphorus is therefore more available once it's sprouted, that could be it. I mean, the phytate might be breaking down, um, but why it has more fiber, I don't know. But um, there isn't a lot of difference. Um, statistically, there is probably not a lot of difference. And um, I haven't seen it being beneficial for removing any of the anti-nutritional factors that might be in the feed or the feed stuff uh, or the grain by, by sprouting it. I have not seen that. But the research shows that, you know, depending on what you're sprouting, it could be beneficial. So uh, with barley, for example, they have had improved digestibility, but not with canola. Canola is more of a protein source. It's higher in fat. So it makes more sense that, you know, the barley, which is a grain would be um, an energy source would be, you know, better for them. And then with regards to the um, anti-nutritional factors, sorghum, as I said, has the tannins in it. And they actually found that sprouting low tannin sorghums actually increased the tannin content in the, the sprouted product. Um, and there was little beneficial effects on the broiler chick's performance. But sprouted pearl millet compared to corn, they found that it must have improved the uh, protein because uh, less soybean meal was uh, required as the protein to go with the, uh, the sprouted grain to make the complete feed. And they found that sprouting the pearl millet improved growth. So um, again, sprouting depends on what you're growing. Um, how long it's been sprouted, how it's been managed, all those, and who they're feeding it to, of course. 
Another thing that has become uh, popular with uh, backyard flocks, some of the small commercial ones, and again with this guy that that does his sustainable stuff is the fermented feed. Again, I haven't seen it had that much effect on uh, anti-nutritional factors, but that would depend on the factor and the grain because I do believe I have seen it work on quinoa. Um, uh, some research when I was at University of Nairobi, one of the master students was looking at fermenting the quinoa to try and uh, make it more usable as a uh, poultry feed, but it is a lot of work. Uh, the benefit depends on the grain and, um, you know, what the effect of the fermentation is, but it also has high risk because of the mold potential. Um, if you're going to do it, there are books on how to ferment feed, and I recommend that if you wanted to try it, read the book because uh, things can go wrong if you're not careful. So there are a number of books out there on sprouting and fermenting feed. I mean, that's a topic all by itself. And um, you have to do it right or you're going to make your birds sick. So um, they are potential things. They may help with some of the anti-nutritional factors, but I think the research on that is um, iffy um, whether or not it works. And basically that's because there's not a lot of money in researching the use of these materials. Uh, because it's not it's not practical on a large scale um, that you would see the companies doing. So um, you know, un unless a bunch of small backyard flocks want to get together and do a SARE grant, SARE is the uh, it's an organization that helps fund small mini grants um, for um, small flocks. If you wanted to do some research on it. Um, you know, more than willing to help you with that. One place where it has been shown to be beneficial is in the fermentation of broccoli residue. I hate broccoli, but if you ferment it and feed it to free range broilers, it was found to reduce any harmful bacterial loads that they may have. And it did, um, improve the the shelf life of the meat by reducing the amount of oxidation that happens in the meat while it sits on the shelf. And it makes use of a waste product. So um, fermentation of waste products may be beneficial. Again, there isn't a lot of research on it. Um, you would have to see what residues you were trying to deal with, what the nutritional contents are, what the problems associated with it, and whether the fermentation would help it. One of the things that fermentation does do is produce a lact of lactobacillus, which is a probiotic, uh, a bacteria that is added to feed to improve the um, microflora of the, of the birds. And so that may be the main benefit of fermentation, but then you could do it simply by providing a probiotic. Less work. Uh, ooh, excuse me. Fats are another possible energy source. Um, again, two and a quarter times as many calories as the same weight of carbohydrates. They can be saturated or unsaturated. Um, and so tallow, which is an animal fat, is, uh, you know, a solid. And then the um, vegetable oils are usually uh, liquid. Fats do play a role uh, other than energy source. Uh, fats are necessary for the absorption of the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. And uh, linoleic acid is an essential fatty acid for laying hens, and so some fat is required for uh, supplying the linoleic acid. Typically, the um, maize uh, or corn, depending on what you would call it, um, has sufficient in it, but if you are using one of the alternative grains to corn, you may find yourself 
uh, needing to add um, something with linoleic acid in it, like a corn oil. Um, and then some people like to have the uh, increased omega-3 fatty acids. Um, you get a premium for omega-3 eggs. It's supposed to be good for brain health as well as heart health. Um, for the, you know, for a long time, it was flaxseed that, that they were um, adding to the feed to get that increase in omega-3 fatty acids. The um, hulls of the flax seeds are very tough. And if you just feed it like that, it will go right through the chicken and you won't get a lot it, out of it. So make sure they have grit if you're feeding flax seed. Um, if you could grind it, that would be better, but it's really hard to grind those tiny seeds. Some other sources are kelp meal and algae meal. There, excuse me, there's a a lot of production these days of algae for um, use in poultry diets and algae meal uh, can be used to increase the omega-3s as well. If you do increase the omega-3s in the feed, um, you often have to provide something to prevent those omega-3s from um, going bad. And so ethoxyquin is the uh, chemical that most feeds add to prevent fat from going rancid. There are uh, organic or um, uh, non-chemical means uh, of preventing it as well for those that are interested in organic feeds. In terms of the dietary protein, you remember meat and eggs are a protein, so um, protein has to be a major component of the diet as well. And um, proteins are made up of amino acids, so the, they are the building blocks for proteins, and you have to have the right amino acids in the right proportions in order to be able to build an egg protein or a muscle protein or whatever. So you need amino acids more than you need uh, total protein. So if you look at um, the feed ingredients here, you can see that, that they give you a very generic a uh, list of ingredients of plant protein products and animal protein products. I mean, that tells you a lot, right? Whole soybeans uh, can be used. Soybean meal is the more commonly used feed ingredient uh, for poultry diets. Uh, if you feed whole soybeans, they have to be roasted because it has a, uh, a trypsin inhibitor. Trypsin is an enzyme that breaks down um, some of the proteins. And so uh, you would have to uh, deactivate that, which you can do by roasting or make extracting the oil. Both will um, get rid of the trypsin inhibitors and make them use. So you could roast the whole, the whole soybeans and then grind them up and um, feed them, or you can get soybean meal. If you, a uh, soybean meal is a uh, solvent extracted, if you are organic, it has to be mechanically extracted, and those are typically referred to as cakes, so soybean cake rather than soybean meal. Field peas have also been used as an option. Typically, they don't need to be roasted, but you need you can only use less of them. Canola meal is, or canola cake is the uh, byproduct after the removal of canola oil from the Canadian version of rapeseed, which it has low uh, anti-nutritional factors that were in the original rapeseed. But it also, depending on the variety, can have some things that cannot be properly um, metabolized by brown egg layers. And so you can get a fishy taint to brown eggs from hens fed canola meals. So you need to watch out for that. Sunflower meal or cake is also uh, used, um, but it's high in fiber. Basically, they dehull it and then put hulls back in to help with the oil extraction because oil is the primary uh, goal, not the meal that's left over. Um, 
And so the amount of five amount of hulls put back in will affect the fiber content, and that will vary depending on uh, the manufacturer. Corn gluten meal is a byproduct from uh, making um, starch out of corn, and so it is a high protein, but it's also very expensive. Um, so it's not used very often, but um, it is a possibility. As far as animal products, rendering industry has made use of processing wastes. And so meat and bone meal and feather meal, feather meal from poultry, meat and bone meal is usually from pigs. Um, we don't typically use the ones from um, cows anymore because of the mad cow disease, but um, pigs can't get it so or don't get it. So meat and bone meal and feather meal are often used in uh, poultry feeds or livestock feeds in general. Fish meal is also, um, whoops, is used as, as a byproduct from uh, fish oil extraction. Alfalfa meal is high in fiber, but uh, has a little bit of protein in it that can be used. It also has pigment, so it can provide uh, that yellow for the yolk and the um, yellow for the skin of the chickens if you're using a grain that does not have yellow in it. Distillers grains uh, are a byproduct of ethanol production, um, which is now big in the United States as they try to get ethanol into gasoline. Uh, it's a protein source because the carbohydrates have been fermented off. It's best if it's used dried, but it's not a must. There, there are those that haven't uh, that have used it that when it's not dried. So distillers grains is a commercial product that is available uh, as they learn about more and more animals that can use it. Um, it's becoming a little bit more expensive, um, but it can be used in uh, poultry diets. But if you use it wet, watch out for mold. Mold's always an issue when you have moisture around. Okay, the um, list of ingredients also includes some pure amino acids, um, particularly lysine and methionine. And this is always a hot topic when talking about organic production. Um, the so-called synthetic or pure amino acids are uh, important when you use um, a minimum number of feed ingredients. So most of the diets are corn, soybean meal based. So that's basically two major ingredients. Um, and you want the right amino acids. So the first two limiting amino acids in a corn, soybean meal based diet is lysine and methionine. And so if they add those as pure amino acids, they don't have to over formulate with the protein in order to meet the uh, amino acid requirement for all the essential amino acids. If you overfeed protein, that nitrogen gets released into the environment and it becomes a pollution problem. So you can do lower protein, uh, total protein diets by using the pure amino acids. The organic community does not like this synthetic methionine. Um, which is more used than the lysine. And um, so they have to or, over formulate on total protein uh, and waste all that nitrogen. Then of course you have to add all the vitamins, uh, fat soluble ones, A, D, E, and K. And it's important to note that chickens use vitamin D3. There are different forms of vitamin D. Uh, if you buy a vitamin D that is for mammals, it's a vitamin D2. And so it won't work with chickens. It has to be a vitamin D3. Um, and so you have to be careful if you're buying supplements for your chickens that it is a D3 vitamin. Uh, a shortage of vitamin D will affect egg production because it's important in calcium utilization. Choline chloride, some debate whether or not it's considered a vitamin, but it functions as one. So I've included it here. And then the, the B vitamins are important as well. 
So as I said, there are the, the fat soluble and the water soluble vitamins. Vitamin K is particularly important in blood clotting and any blood, any vitamin K deficiency will result in more um, blood eggs, blood spot eggs. A is important for normal growth and development of the epithelial tissue. Um, D3 for normal growth, bone development, and uh, eggshell formation. Vitamin E is an antioxidant. So if your diets are high in uh, omega-3s, they are often also high in selenium and uh, vitamin E, which are antioxidants. Then you got all the B vitamins. Vitamin C is not typically added to poultry feeds. And the only time you really need to supplement with vitamin C is during times of stress. Chickens can produce vitamin C, but in times of stress, they need a little bit more. So sometimes in heat stress, some of the hot climates will provide vitamin C in the water to help them get through that heat stress. Uh, and then of course you have all the minerals uh, in there, which does include salt. Salt is um, has sodium and chloride, which are uh, minerals. The macro minerals are the ones you need in the larger quantity, uh, calcium and phosphorus, chlorine, sodium, potassium, magnesium. Calcium and phosphorus are very important for skel skeleton formation. Calcium is extremely important in muscle function. Uh, a low calcium in an egg laying hen, for example, can result in prolapse and becoming egg bound and all sorts of other problems because it's needed for proper muscle function. And it is a muscle that pushes the egg out. The um, sodium, potassium, magnesium, they're all important for um, osmotic regulation in the body function, making sure that you know all the fluids in the body function properly. Uh, limestone is usually what we add for uh, um, calcium carbonate. Um, you can also use oyster shell or any kind of shell actually. Uh, bone meal, another one of those fermented products that are rendering products from um, uh, harvesting uh, animals can also be used as a source of calcium. Dicalcium phosphate can also be used. Um, trace mineralized salt sometimes is used. Um, I didn't see it listed on the thing, it just said salt. But um, there are also the micro minerals, copper, iodine, iron, magnesium, selenium, zinc, they all play major roles in the metabolism in the body. And so you have to make sure that they're there. Um, sometimes in very trace amounts. So if you're adding it, you have to make sure it's well mixed in the feed. You'll also see sometimes lignin sulfonate is added to some of the feeds. This, is a, this was a pelleted feed and the lignin sulfonate is added as a pellet binder. That means it helps to hold the pellets together when they mix them. So some of them, uh, feed manufacturing, things that you see in industry that you may or may not want to include in, you know, if you're making your own diets, whether that is choice feeding or um, whole grains or whatever um, you're using, uh, some like the addition of fat to the diets, it helps to slow down the rate of passage of the feed through the digestive tract, which incre increases digestion. It also helps control dust. Steam pelleting and conditioning is uh, used to improve the utilization of certain nutrients. This is especially important in some of the alternative grains. The use of dietary enzymes, there are a lot that are commercially available these days. Um, and they help to break down some of the poorly digested dietary components. A lot of the grains are low in minerals. They do have some phosphorus, but the phosphorus is um, bound to uh, something called phytate. And so phytase is an enzyme that breaks down phytate. And it was one of the first enzymes to be commercialized. Um, for use in poultry diets to help release the phosphorus that is available in 
uh, some of the plant ingredients in uh, poultry diets. Therefore, you have to add less of the, um, the inorganic phosphorus. So you get less phosphorus coming out at the end with the poop. And so it's less of a um, pollution problem uh, with the phosphorus. Uh, as I already mentioned, the use of synthetic amino acids gives you a better balance with the lower protein diets. Um, and then the grinding of the cereal grains, some said it increases the surface area for more efficient digestion. And yet others say that feeding whole grains is better for digestion as well. So uh, it depends on your situation, your birds and how you're mixing uh, everything together. Uh, if you're mixing your own feeds, you know, in your backyard or, or whatever, typically it's a mash um, because you need special equipment in order to make pellets. And then crumbles are just pellets that are broken up for a size more suitable for chicks. Uh, probiotics was something I mentioned uh, earlier that... Um, Fermenting basically increases the production of lactic acid bacteria in the mixture. And so uh, lactobacillus, uh, all you know, those lactic acid bacteria uh, are what we consider healthy uh, bacteria. And they compete against the bad bacteria to keep out, um, you know, possible disease problems. So uh, feeding a probiotic, which is, you know, basically a live uh, batch of, of uh, microorganisms, helps uh, for the body. It prevents the reproduction of the pathogenic ones, uh, so it reduces their harmful effects. It helps to regulate the absorption of minerals, gases, and water. It helps with the digestion of carbohydrates and proteins, strengthens the immune system. Most of the uh, immune system of birds is in the intestines. Uh, it improves digestion, intestinal motility, uh, helps normalize the cholesterol level, which is uh, more for us, but um, cholesterol goes into eggs too. Uh, it also, the probiotics can produce vitamin K, um, the precursor for vitamin B12, some of the B vitamins as well. So um, you're getting some nutrients with the probiotics. Typically, you only have to feed the probiotic until they get established. You don't necessarily have to feed it over and over and over again, um, unless you feed an antibiotic or the birds get stressed or they have some sort of a disease problem, then you have to uh, re-establish that healthy gut by feeding the probiotics again. The best thing is also to provide a prebiotic and a prebiotic is simply a non-digestible food ingredient that stimulates the growth and activity of the probiotic. So um, the materials go undigested down through the, the digestive tract of the chicken, they make it to the two blind pouches at the end called Sika, and there they can be uh, fermented by these beneficial bacteria. So you're basically providing the feed for the probiotic. And again, they stimulate the growth of the uh, good stuff. They improve the work of the digestive system. They stimulate peristalsis, which is basically the uh, movement of the intestines to push food through, they stimulate the immunity, they remove excess mucus from the walls of the small intestine, reduce the formation of gases, suppress the reduction in the intestines of the pathogenic bacteria by keeping the good bacteria uh, well fed. So basically, you have a prebiotic, which is a chemical substance or fiber that animals cannot digest, but promotes the growth of uh, good microbes. Then you have the good microbes. And then a symbiotic is basically a mixture of the two with the symbiotic, with the prebiotic selected specifically for the probiotic that's giving, being uh, given. Um, 
There is some use these days with e essential oils. You have to be careful because a lot of them sell them as um, you know, the latest snake oil. Uh, but there is some research to show that essential oils are beneficial. Um, they have an antibacterial effect. Uh, they enhance the production of digestive secretions. They stimulate blood circulation. They have some antioxidant properties. Uh, again, reduce the levels of pathogenic bacteria, but you have to watch out. They have antibacterial effects. So if they're reducing the pathogenic bacteria, they may also be reducing the beneficial bacteria. So you got to watch that. Uh, may enhance the immune system. Um, Again, you could do a whole talk on essential oils, which I am trying to organize for um, next year in our next calendar of uh, upcoming talks. I'm hoping essential oils will be one of those topics. So there are a lot of different resources available. You can uh, email me directly, I'll help where I can. Uh, we do have a website, poultryextension.org. Um, there are articles on a variety of different topics. As I said in the beginning, our webinars are recorded and all the past webinars have been posted uh, on that, that website. Uh, it lists upcoming webinars, which for right now is just next month's webinar on uh, poultry anatomy. Uh, I try to maintain a blog on a variety of different topics. It also has ask extension where you can type in a question. It gets sent off to the system and assigned to an expert for an answer. Um, we're supposed to try and get them done within 48 hours, but if it happens on a weekend, uh, our experts are usually taking time off too. So uh, it can take a little longer. Um, and sometimes questions get lost in the system, unfortunately. So uh, you actually get uh, a faster response if you email me directly than uh, trying to use the Ask Extension service. It does have, uh, you can do Ask Extension on anything related to extension. So not just poultry, you can ask questions about pigs and sewing and cooking and, you know, extension covers a lot of different things. So. Um, you can ask on other topics as well that I can't answer. I'm just the poultry person. And we do have a Facebook page um, that uh, we post upcoming webinars, latest news, especially with the avian influenza problem that we're having at the moment um, and anything else that comes up that would be of interest to uh, producers. So. Um, those are the resources available. I'll try and stick those links into the chat box uh, once I start stopped here. Here we go. And I saw there was one question that um, uh, will soaking fermenting grains help remove some of the anti-nutritional elements? Um, are there other benefits for fermenting feed? I think I answered that one. Um, while I was talking, um, some nutritional elements maybe, but not necessarily all of them. Um, and there are some fermenting benefits, but I think most of that is just a probiotic. Um, but it depends on the what you're fermenting and how well you do it. And what's my opinion on nutritional yeast for B vitamins? They have been shown to be a good source uh, depending on how you maintain the yeast. The yeast can also be functional as a prebiotic. The yeast walls are often used uh, as a prebiotic um, for, um, for poultry as well. So um, I think that that answers those questions. And then I was gonna take my links from my resources. Whoops, I gotta get out of that. Uh, so this is our web page, And this is our Facebook page. 
Hey, Joe, yes, back, back to the USA. I was in Guatemala, and then I was in Bangladesh, and then I got COVID. Uh, BF, I joined late, so I'm happy to review the recording when this is posted. But in case it was not discussed, did you talk about the pros and cons of feeding table scraps? No, I did not talk about that. That was probably something I, uh, over, uh, I missed. Um, table scraps can be great. Um, especially for small flocks, um, even some of the larger ones, you know, if you can get good table scraps, but you have to be careful for the molds. Molds are always uh, a problem, so you should never leave them overnight. Um, and it depends on what the table scraps are, because um, some things are good, some things not. Um, so uh, yeah, table scraps can be good, um, usually, at, you know, at the end of the day, depends on whether or not you are using it as a main source of the of the feed or are using it to supplement some feed, um, especially, you know, if you've got birds on pasture, they're not getting a lot, maybe feeding a little bit of table scraps so that, um, you know, you're supplementing and you're reducing wastage, but really, really watch out for mold. That's always the the key thing is um, watching out for mold. So uh, it's 4.02, so we went over time a little bit. Um, it's really, I mean, I can't give specifics for any one farm on how to make your own feed, what equipment, what, you know, you have to look at each individual situation. What can you, um, what can you purchase in order to be able to, um, you know, get what you need uh, to be the complete feat? So uh, Joe asked, did I miss it or did you not discuss the use of scratch grains? No, I didn't, I didn't really talk about scratch grains as a, a diluting on the complete feed because we were talking about mixing your own feed. But one of the main problems that I see in um, small and backyard flocks is they buy a complete feed and then to try and reduce costs, they mix it sometimes 50-50 with scratch grains. Scratch grains are just a bunch of different grains um, that's basically an energy source, very low in protein. And so it's like feeding your kids uh, French fries and then expecting them to eat a nice nutritious diet. It, it just doesn't happen. So um, the use of scratch grains when using a complete feed is not recommended. Um, you can give a few handfuls in the evening, you know, for them to finish up in like 10, 15 minutes as a treat if you want for a small flock. Um, but overuse of scratch feeds to dilute a complete grain a complete feed uh, will cause nutritional deficiencies. And that's most of the health issues that I get phone calls from are people um, diluting a complete feed with uh, scratch grains. Now, uh, I don't see why, depending on what the scratch grains are, why you couldn't use scratch grains as your energy source with your nutrient balancer. So we talked at the beginning about, you know, growing your own grains uh, and all these different grains that could work uh, rather than just corn. And so scratch grains, that's all they are, is scratch grains. There's a variety of different grains, um, mostly just the junk that's been lying around. But uh, you could use that at least part of, of the grain mixture, the energy mixture for combining with uh, a protein balancer. So that is one option for using scratch uh, grains, but uh, with a complete feed, it is not recommended. That's where all my health problems come when I, I see, you know, people call me up with 
um, they're having a nutritional deficiency or you know the, the chickens have gotten sick or they've stopped laying eggs or whatever and their immune system has been compromised because they took a complete feed and diluted not only the protein but the vitamins and the minerals so either feed a complete feed or come up with something else but make sure whatever you come up with meets the nutritional requirements of the birds. So the energy, the protein with its amino acids, the vitamins, the minerals, all of that uh, has got to be in whatever you come up with as a replacement for the complete feed. So we're over time. Anybody have any other questions? My voice managed to stay. Uh, I think I'm out of quarantine tomorrow. So <coughs> uh, hopefully. Uh, COVID's a nasty thing. So any other questions? Say next month is on uh, a general anatomy. If you are interested in that, um, I will try to make it how that anatomy can uh, be affected in the um, health of the birds. So when you're detecting problems. So that is December the 6th uh at 3 p.m so okay not seeing any more questions thank you all for coming i hope i see you uh next week uh next month if you have any topics i'm trying to put together the list of topics for next year please email me with your suggested topics um Right now, I'm looking at things like essential oils. Uh, pasture poultry was one that people uh, wanted more details on, um, but I'm always looking for suggestions for topics. Look at what we've had in the past and see uh, if there is something that you would like to know more about. I know essential oils are always uh, a hot topic. so. Everybody have a good evening and um, maybe I'll see you next. Uh,